Shabbat Shalom to all of you. This morning, we have a, one of the most important parasha in the whole Torah. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is one of the things that we need to look at very carefully, and we are going to be talking for a long time. It's about the giving of the Torah, Matan Torah, not the giving of the Torah. And it's, it's so special, but at the same time, I want, I all, always I have asked you and have requests from you to be open-minded in the sense of don't be so literalist, at the same time, don't, don't be tunnel vision. But try to see, try to see a larger picture of what is happening. Believe me or not, until today, the greatest rabbis they are having a, what I call a arguments about the timing in which this uh, Torah, uh, uh, this portion was written, especially the portion of Jitro. There are many people that say that was written before, that is, is in the right place. Most of them, the very, very renowned rabbis say totally the contrary, was written uh, uh, after, but what happened that was put in, in there for reasons of editorializing and to make it sound better. You know, many times I have repeat to you about this uh, statement in the scriptures. It's about, uh, basically, the statement is that the Bible, not necessarily, is written in a chronological way. What is written is in a way to teach us very special principles that God tries to give it to us. This is the reason that sometimes when you become so, uh, I would say, you become so literalist, you can miss very important points that is done. For example, there are arguments pro and con about why Jitro was not written on, uh, uh, at the time of chronological and why Jitro was written chronological. There is a group of rabbis uh, that are interested enough, I have mentioned to you before, but uh, it's in, uh, the two Ramban, the Ramban with N and the Ramban with N, they are con constantly in contradiction. Ramban with M, Maimonides, came before Ramban with N, eh, Nachmanides. Then, eh, Ramban, eh, Maimonides, is from the group of rabbis who say that it's not chronological. But uh, Nachmanides is very, very strong literalist, and he says that is eh, chronological. That makes any difference or not? I want to tell you no difference at all. It was before or after. Because the issue is not before or after, the issue is that was given. Sometimes we, we fight for things that are not important. No. Uh, there must be a reason why it was given in this way. And there are be, be, and I can tell you that both sides have good arguments. That's not what is interesting. That when you find two sides fighting and both sides have good arguments. But at the end, is not to take sides, at the end is to try to say what is God's intention and what he is trying to tell us through all of this. Here, we are going to see, for example, one of the discussions among the rabbis. They are constantly discussing. For example, if Jitro was the first convert to Judaism or not, and they really G uh, Jitro believe in one God or he start believing in many gods. You know, uh, and that the only thing that he did is gave preeminence to the God of Israel. Uh, well, you know, in Psalms, you have many times when they put God and especially talks of, against idolatry. In the, in the book of Psalms will say, you know, you are the greatest God among all the gods. You know, that means that the, the psalmist who wrote the portion didn't be, be, believe in other gods too. No, uh, you, you can say whatever you can to say, but the truth of the matter is, sometimes the way they are written, and it's written for a time of period of people that already they knew, they knew about 
this is very important, they knew about other gods. You know, um, uh, today, here among us, how many gods that exist in the world? You have plenty of gods. And you know, and they are recognized as God, but it doesn't mean that they are the true gods. Uh, um, this is the, the, the problem when sometimes people have a, and the difference between religions and different systems of belief. There is one God or there is thousand God. Now, all the monotheistic religions, you know, those ones who believe in only one God. It is very interesting. Among the religions themselves, they say that their God is not like the other God and they is not the other God. But it's the only one God. The which God is the true God? No? This is the process of, that is given to Israel. If you start the reading from the, the beginning of Hasefer Shemo, the book of Exodus, you're going to see that also already from the beginning, chapter 3 of uh, Shemo, God tells Moses that they're going to go out and they are going to worship at, the, at this mountain. You know, Har Elohim is called, or uh, Har Horeb, the mountain of Horeb, and also it's called Har Sinai. You know? Um, this is all a, a set of a term that is used for this special mountain. But sometimes we need to be careful that we're talking about only one mountain. It could be a set of mountains and there's one specific there. It, it's, it's a general term and there is one specific mountain there. You know, it could be a chain of mountains and the one, the tallest one, this is the place. Uh, there are so many geographical this, uh, arguments today about where really this mountain was located. We talked last week a little bit about how our archaeologists are trying to find the, the, the right place and, um, and the place that we have today is not a real place. But all those things need to be taken in consideration in the sense of what is, what is important. It is important the mountain or is important what was given in the mountain. Why I say it in this way? Because sometimes we make sacred places that are more sacred than God himself. And doing that, we become idolaters without even realizing. Because we are worshiping the place instead of worshiping the God of the place. Uh, uh, have you hear me saying this before? Uh, especially among my Gentile friends. You know, they start worshiping the people instead of worshiping the God of the people. You know, they idealize the Jewish people and they put in a pedestal instead to worship the God of Israel. And we need to be constantly checking ourselves and making a clear difference between one and the other to see where we are and what we are doing. Not because I dress in black and I have a huge hat, black, a, a huge black hat, and I have huge peyotes or circle here on my side, means that I am closer to God than somebody who doesn't wear anything. You know, the uniform doesn't make the believer. This is something that we need to be careful. We are constantly accustomed to make differences by the uniform instead to make the difference for what is inside us. This is what God has called us to be, and what, is, what God is intended messages for all of us. And you're going to see here. Now, before I get in, in the, and this is modern, or, or that this is something unusual, this is new, or they have never seen before, all these uh, words of God, especially the Ten Commandments, we, uh, we need to understand this. Many of these things that were here, that were given by God, already the people at that time knew about them. This is not something that just came out of, it, of, of nothing. The people already had, had this, this belief or these ideas or these concepts that they practice or they don't practice is totally different, but those concepts were already there. Then, what if really God did with all of them? With this? this is important to to get the, the sense of God's revelation to Israel. You know, 
It is unique, yes, it's unique in the way that was delivered, it's unique in the way that was given, it is unique in the way that has been structured. <coughs> but sometimes we forget, and let me tell you, the same way that many religions, they forget who, who is the true God, and they think that the God stopped when the religion started, Israel sometimes forget that God already existed before Israel was created. Okay? And then, we need to look at the God before even the creation. Because God doesn't have beginning or end. And it's so easy to say that my God begins here. You know, it's like a Martian, when he said, you know, the God of the Old Testament is, 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 is not the God of the New Testament. Because he didn't know who God was, really. You know, if there is only one God, you know, this God continues being the same thing. You know, interesting, that statement, God of yesterday is the same of today and will be the same forever. God never changed. Then who is the one that changed? If God doesn't change, who changes? We change. And this is the idea that we need to start uh, really looking at and searching when we are looking for answers. You know, who was the one that changed? Who was the one that said this and that? And who was the one that didn't do it? In all of this, we, we are going to have also a very interesting interaction between God and the people of Israel. The reason many of the uh, sages and rabbis tell us that we needed to get out of Egypt, according to the scriptures, was in order that we can worship God at the mountain of Elohim, Har Elohim. Okay? What was so important that mountain? Because there God was going to reveal his total presence to his people, and he was going to give it to them, the task to be the the uh, the light to the world, or Legoyim. If they were going to be the example to the world, and they were going to be the messengers of the true God for all the world. That's what basically uh, was going to be the God of Israel was going to do. In this cha in this parasha, in chapter 19, we have the expression that God will say to to the people of Israel, that they are going to have, the, the, it's going to be a manless head, no? Kohanim, Begoich Kadosh. A manless head, a manless head, Kohanim, Begoich Kadosh, is going to be a kingdom of holy people. Now, this is also very interesting. A kingdom of priests, I'm sorry, of holy people, no? Maleje Kohanim Begoy Kadosh. A kingdom of priests and holy people. What it means is this. What is the idea of priests? Because it's important to understand uh, what was the idea of what was the message of God. If you start to examine the ideas about priests, sometimes you become a little bit blur and a little bit. Uh, uh, Saitra, because of the definition that you would have you have learned through the to the thousands of years, you know. But a, a, a priest, of course, a, and in the old times, would fu function as an special go between, as a mediator, if you can put it that way, between God and the rest of the people. He was the go between. He was the spokesperson. He was the the, the teacher, you know, that was the, the priest. The priest was like a, in, in a, it's like a chain, and it's one of the links, you know? Uh, this is a link between the people and God. That's what priest means, you know? And being the top person for God also has a function sometimes of being like a, a Nabi. A prophet. Then the, the functions you are going to see uh, will change according to the circumstances and the situation. Then Israel 
yourself. Being a messenger, okay, was going to be the link between God and the rest of the world. For that reason, by the way, it's not so strange that Rashid, a great rabbi of the 11th century, the, of the common era, you know, uh, will we'll say that the, the Messiah is Israel, the people of Israel, you know? Um, and he was not totally out of place, but he, he, uh, he didn't want to define that this messenger was a person, not the whole uh, uh, the, the whole people of Israel. If each one is going to give you part of the understanding or definition to try to protect themselves from supposedly other religions or trying to answer other religions. And what happened with the time? What happened is that because other religions has but I would call it thing up, I don't know the better term to take, on certain principles and ideas of my religion, then what I do is I react against them and I start to eliminate all those things that already are part of me, but are because somebody else uses it, I don't use it anymore. I want to tell you, to give you a clear idea, because I personally am going through that problem. I uh, has had advisors that, that, that has told me to do something different. You know, for example, to call myself the Messianic Jew. It's, it's a very difficult term. Because that term now has been abused and misused. A Messianic Jew now is anybody. And you don't know what do they really believe or they don't believe. They, Constantly, when I say that I am a Messianic Jew, I need to almost constantly need, need, need to define myself or qualify and, and, and become tireless. You know, they, I, you know, need to get to the point that you need to say, you know, enough is enough. We are who we are. If somebody is interested to know who we are, they need to ask. But the point, 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 uh, point to that. Are, are only Jews? Yeah, we are Jews. And, and we can call ourselves Jews, yes. No problem. But uh, what we do, made the emphasis on the army messianic Jews, because we are making the emphasis about that already God has fulfilled his words in, in, in the area and the Messiah has come. No, like most of the uh, rabbinical Judaism still deny the Messiah has not come. Now, why the majority, why the majority of uh, Judaism? normal Judaism today, they cannot accept that the Messiah has already come. Because accepting that, that will be to eat what I call it, to take the humble pie. You know, to eat the humble pie and to say, you know what? We have been wrong for so many years. And beautifully enough, you know, beautifully enough, you know, and maybe you can make it as a principle, more religious you are, more proud of yourself you are. Pride is an invasion of a view. I never do anything wrong. I am always right. I am always correct. That is the religious person. I will never believe something that is heretic. I will never believe something that is wrong. Boy, you, you put yourself a lot of uh, weight over, over you. You are not God. Do you know that for the mere fact that we are human beings, we are limited? I don't know if people understand that. And I am not I am playing a limitation, I am playing a reality. You know, I wish that we could fly. But the truth of the matter, if you jump from the 20th floor of any building, you're going to crash. You know, you're going to die. And later the angels of God will call you in the, in the wings or in their arms. You know, but if you don't have a good relationship with God, I don't know what is going to happen to you. Then we need to be clear on this, what is given the Matan Torah. Okay. The Matan Torah, is, is, there is a Greek word called Theophany. Okay, because I, I couldn't find a better word for that. And, and that is the manifestation 
of God in, in his fullness. Interestingly enough, the whole people of Israel, okay, the whole people of, of Israel were a, um, present in that moment. And they saw God's manifestation. They saw God manifestation. What I made this statement? Because they were afraid to see God and to die. They were afraid that the, the manifestation of God was going to be so huge that they could die with the, the, the thunders and the, and, the, and the commotion, the earthquakes and everything. What happened to that moment there? I don't know, but that was something uh, greater than, than any, anything happened. But then, after they, before they knew what they were doing, it's interesting, before they knew what they were doing, all of them they say, you know, Kola cher di vera donaina ase. No? Big mouth that we have. He said, all that the Lord has spoken, we shall do. And by the way, that is not only for the people who were present. That is for all the generations until today have not passed by. Here is what I need to give you because I want to uh, instead to talk about so much about the, the what happened, didn't happen, was chronological, but not chronological. I want to talk to you about giving of the Torah in a way that we need to understand it or receive it. Many people say it needs to be word by word. You know? What happens if you do not understand even what God did? Let you going to understand word by word. Because it doesn't have any meaning to you. The basic thing is that uh, he gave us what I call the aseret, the bread. You know, the, what do we call it? The ten words. These ten words that is mentioning in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, uh, as in, with that title, <laughs> we, we know as the aseret misvot, or, or uh, asara misvot, that would be in feminine. Uh, the, is the Ten Commandments. Now, I want that you go a little bit with me in the, in the sense of God speaking to us in a way that we are scared to death. And we are hearing thunders and we're hearing voice. And the call the bell, the, vo the voice of God that spoke to us and, and start trembling. You know, one thing is uh, the what, word by word. Another thing is that you understand within you. You know, I have had experiences. Uh, to be honest to you, I can say, you know, I hear the voice of God. And people say, how he talk to you? What kind of voice he use? What kind of, the, you know, uh, uh, it's not, I understood. was given to me an understanding. I, I, you see, uh, I cannot say, oh, Percy, hello, Percy, I'm talking to you. you know, I will be jumping to the other side, you know, I don't know. You know it was not like that. It was more like a, was working within me. Now, these people hear a voice, hear Sandra, hear Sansa, and they understood. Or he was being said, and God said, I am the Lord, your God. He started like that. Can you imagine what happened in that moment? Now, in this, uh, and I want to make it very special. In these Ten Commandments, okay, is to me is everything that God wants to teach us. To be honest to you, uh, then uh, the rabbis started diminishing to the last one, and Yeshua himself came with the same idea that the rabbis had about the, the were how many uh, commandments we need to keep, and how many commandments were important. They went from ten to three, from three to one, you know. Um, but these ten commandments are very special if we understand it in this way. You're going to 
see, especially in, in the book of Vayikra, uh, Leviticus, the constant they want to mention him like a misvot, here to the next of two, Hukim and Mishpatim. Okay, these three terms are important to understand. Misvot means a literal translation is commandments. Right, you know, command that is given to you. The second part, Hukim, is the basically uh, the ordinance given by a, a superior to you. It's like you are in the army and you say, give me this or bring me this, you know, and you don't know for what it is, only that you need to bring it. You don't question, you go and you do it. That's the hooking. Okay? And the third level, or the third division, instead of putting levels, division, is called mishpatim. And mishpatim means the judgments. And the judgments is the, what do we call it? Uh, we uh, uh, laws, okay, regulations, the legal system, if we can call it. Now, you have the legal system. And all the, do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Only, uh, I wonder, you see, this, the three first commandments, we can call it misvots, okay? The, the, the fourth and fifth commandment, we can call it Hukim. And from the sixth to the ten, we can call it generally to a Mishpatim. Now, that doesn't mean that a Mishpatim can be a Mishpatim or what does it? Uh, yes and no. Because the, the Mishpatim is Adam Hedero Adam. You know, what it means is uh, the man to man is a relationship with God. Meanwhile, the misvot is a relationship with God. And uh, a hukim is an ordinance of God that we can understand partially, but we do not have the whole picture of it. For example, uh, the Shabbat is a hukim. No, because uh, they, they say about remembrance of creation, but also remembrance of when we were slaves, you know, uh, remembrance of resting. There, there is a lot of things there that go beyond our own capability to understand it completely, but God gave it to us for a reason. And then, in the same way, is the Honor your father and your mother. Because honor your father and your mother, it is a consequence of God is our creator. Okay? And um, your parents, through God, they had a function of creating you as a human being. And then honoring your parents means that you are honoring God. But there is other things in there that is the reason that they call it hukim. And it is not a mishpatim, a legal, legal thing. You know, even though, believe me or not, there are certain societies today, and I know one specifically in one Latin American country, I know the case that a father sued his children for a, what do you call it, alimony or something like that, because he was literally in poverty and uh, he didn't have enough money to maintain himself. And uh, even that he had divorced his mother and married to somebody else. And he came the case, believe me or not. Okay? Then, but that's not in the, in the scriptures. And the scriptures said to honor them, to put them. And of course, if your partner and your mother has a need, you don't need to be sued. <laughs> you know, come from you. It's natural. Should be. Then, now, if you see these three sides, the Torah foundation is there. What is
is important, okay, what is important to see in the, in the whole thing is, then uh, based on these ten, command, uh, ten commandments or ten words, God developed and explained a little bit more certain steps and certain things and making Israel a different people than the rest of the world. Why Israel need to be different? I'm secular, a special people. Because they were going to be the leaders. They were doing the ones that they're going to show the rest of the world the way. Now the question is this, has Israel done that? And you're going to see that Israel has done it even without wanting. This is not very interesting. Why I say this? Because many people think that if I oppose God, I, and God won't do his job. Like I have the power to stop God. It's like when I say that, when the, uh, the one that is a uh, atheist, you know, pronounce, and he said, God doesn't exist. And God will say, okay, I won't exist anymore. And this is ludic ludicrous. We need to come back to the scriptures and to see what the scriptures say and how they reveal. Now, we are in these 10 words. And these 10 words has a meaning and is going to build us as a human being. What is important also, what I just mentioned to you before, these words that are there are not exclusively, were not the first time that were initiating for the humanity. Other people had these laws. They knew about them in different ways. They were not written in specifically in the way that God gave it to Israel, but they were already there. For example, in many of these uh, civilizations before Israel, who were developed, were very well developed, you know, to kill was wrong. What was the difference with, the, with, with Israel not to kill? Very simple. In, in, in those civilizations, you could kill anybody. Okay? And, and if you have a higher ranking than the other, you were above the law. Here, nobody is above the law. Everybody is the same. That's what I we can differ. All Israel. Why? Because was not Moses alone who received the Torah. Was the whole people of Israel who were there, including, and this is important, including the Ereb Ra, the mixed multitude. That makes it universal. Already, already God is talking about a universal God. And then when Jethro say, now I believe and I understand that you are the greatest God among all the gods, he was acknowledging that he was the only God. Thing that I want to make you understand. Look at Moshe Rabbeinu is called the Torah giver. You know? And what I say to you, instead to call him the Torah giver, let's call him the transmitter of the Torah. Another thing is, please, because even I see it in the Jewish uh, books to today, don't call it law. I know that will be difficult to pull that tooth out of your mouth without anesthesia, but you need to change your way of thinking. It is not, it is not law. And I don't know, sometimes I get, no, but the law say this. What law? What are you talking about? No. God gave us principles. You know, uh, do you remember that uh, there was a saying, uh, like a very joking, they say, you know, they don't call it any longer the Ten Commandments. Now they call it the Ten Suggestions. 
you know, that's to tell you how we have decayed in our understanding about how important the Word of God is. And calling it law has given us a legalistic frame in which we are or we feel, but anyways or other ways, oppressed by something that we're put in a box. And we human beings, we love to be put in a box. You have heard me many times saying this, that God doesn't punish you. You punish yourself. In other words, you harvest what you planted. But we are so quick to say, oh, God punished me. Let's examine this this way. When mommy says, don't do that, and you do it, and mommy give you with, a, with whoever she has on her hand, like my mother. I always pray that my mother has something soft and not too hard. You know, but it's always she got the hardest, I don't know why. But anyway, and uh, uh, when she gave me, I, I would say, who, who, was, uh, who was punishing? My mother? The, the, the role? Or myself. Think about that. Huh? <laughs> you know? I, I would say to my man, you know, your teachings are very good, but it hurts. You know? Um, I learn very fast. Now, the same thing we do with God. We blame God for everything. You know, when you talk about the Shoah, you're going to see a lot of people that are very bitter. Where God was when I was there? That is the question. And I always say God was always with you, suffering with you. No. And it's very easy for me to say that because I was not there. You know, who I am, I want to tell you that. But, but God did something through that suffering that brought it back to Israel. But another thing that is also important to understand, what I would call it the collective responsibility, that sometimes we do not understand. You know, uh, I just read in the today's news that in Afghanistan just yesterday, somebody blocked himself, you know? And there were 21 deaths, and the Mondo, 21, I think, 13 were Americans and Canadians. Okay? And that's very sad. Now, those people are there to help these people. They're there to be here to, to help their teachers, their, all these kind of things. Doctors, nurses, they have been blown up. The question is this what these people did wrong? But we are suffering the consequences of the disobedience to God. And in the disobedience to God, there are consequences. And they suffer too, good and evil. Everybody suffers. Let me go back to the point that I'm trying to make. When God gave the world and the teachings, was for us to apply in our life and to be clear that there were certain things that were not good for us because if we did it, we would destroy ourselves and destroy our community. That was so important. You know, people can say, oh no, it's my life. Another good example that I can give it to you is about the AIDS epidemic at the beginning here in Canada with the Red Cross and the blood because they didn't want to embarrass a certain group of people. They didn't want to ask them about their lifestyle. They took any blood that they, they could take, you know? And then, what were the consequences? A lot of children dying because of that transfusion of blood. Whose fault was we, a society, because we didn't have the turpitude, we didn't have the guts, we didn't have the, the honesty to ask the simple question. I am not judging you 
but I am taking care of, of, the, of the people. I am responsible, you are responsible, we are responsible. When the people of Israel say, with, with these words, that they say, Kola Sherdiver Adonai Nase. You know, we going to do it. You know, this is something that what he has spoken, we will do. We are then participating. We are saying, this is my word. I am giving my word. And from that moment on, I am responsible. And that responsibility has been transferred to us. Here comes the, the important thing. One thing is what God tells us. Another thing is what men tell us. And today we are so confused, so confused about what really God intended to tell us. Because you, you hear from this way, and you hear from this way, and you hear from up, and you hear from the, all those sides. Everybody is going to give you their opinion. And then you are completely, uh, totally uh, lost, without direction. And you need to understand what you have. And here comes an inside issue. In order that you focus this giving of the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu, and you compare with a Messiah Yeshua in two occasions. The first one when he started the ministry on the earth, and the second one when he departed from us. And when you want to see that in both of them, our Messiah Yeshua is fulfilling his task as the Messiah who is going to bring him back to Torah. The worst part has been that our Messiah Yeshua has been used against the Torah. Including Rabbi Shaul that is known as the uh, as Apostle Paul. They have been giving to him words that he never said that goes against the Torah. Or words like uh, the Torah, you know, something like that. Without Torah, we didn't know what I was saying. This is written. Like, you need to examine the words because I always say that you need to take in consideration whatever is written after the Torah. After the Torah, you need to you need to go look it through the Torah. Not through the writings, but through the Torah. If the writings say something, please check it with the Torah. No backwards. You know, the Shevi and Pei, the oral Torah, had not replaced the Torah. But in our religious uh, way of life, our rabbinical Judaism has replaced the Torah to the point that today our greatest rabbi study more the Shevi and Pei and they know better the oral Torah than the Torah itself. In Christianity, we had the same idea. The so-called New Testament, I call it the Messianic writings, has more authority than the Torah itself, to the point that it has a statement, similar to what the rabbinical Judaism has. Rabbinical Judaism says, that the oral Torah has the right to change the Torah. You know? In Christianity, it has a statement like this. If you go to any book of systematic theology in Christianity, and you're going to read this. The, or, the New Testament interpret the whole Bible. This is the problem. What Yeshua came to undo Supposedly his followers, they did worse. <coughs> Instead to undo it, they destroyed. When Yeshua said, I has come not to destroy, but to fulfill it, to make it full, 
to complete it, to, to make it right. And he was talking to the, to the, to the Jews. Comes the Goyim, the Gentiles, and they tell you, we don't need any longer Torah. The Torah is disappeared because Jesus fulfilled it on himself. Then we are in a jeopardy. We are in a very hard place. And we are in a place that we sometimes we are alone. Because nobody wants to really listen what our God is trying to tell us. Because for us it's more important to be accepted by a religion than, than to be right with God. They say God doesn't know. The people know. That's what I was saying. When Yeshua came, the greatest <coughs> twisters of the word of God were the religious people with the so-called traditions, basically has annulled the word of God. That's what he said. Interestingly enough, he quote Yeshayahu Hanavi. Now, I don't know if this is only as an interest or, 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 or giving you, because in, in the scripture there's nothing there for coincidence. Yeshayahu is another name of Yeshua. Isn't that interesting? It's another form of Yeshua, salvation. 700 years prior to Yeshua coming, already they had done those changes. Many people think that the change was when Jesus was there. That change was already long ago. If you take your time, and you can read Chronicles and the Kings, there are two, re two kings that to me comes to my, to my mind, Hezekiah and Josiah, Yeshayahu. And these two kings are very important because these two kings started with a heart to make it and to bring us back to Torah. They did a revolution against all the ways, but at the end, both of them also missed the point. They say that the world is full of good intentions. But we need to understand this. To me, it's important that we understand it. <coughs> is that we need to have community because in that way, we can check each other and we can be balanced. It's not good that one is above anybody else. And it's not good that one has more authority than others in the sense of, you know, what I say is done. No. I struggle all my life with that. Because I need to be very careful. Sometimes, you know, I have my ideas. Well, are my ideas or God's ideas? Well, how I get the real things? I need to talk to others. And then I need to make the decision. And that's the painful part. But, Always, we need to check ourselves. Then, our Messiah Yeshua came to bring us back to Torah. And interestingly enough, his retractors and his followers, this is his retractors and his followers are doing exactly the opposite that he asked us to do. And I call it followers those who they call themselves followers of Jesus Christ and they say no. Because they follow somebody else, but I'm not Yeshua. Honestly, the retractors are all the Orthodox Jews, Judaism. You know? That they, they tell that he is not the Messiah, that he didn't fulfill anything, that he didn't accomplish anything. It's totally the contrary. He accomplished everything that he needed to accomplish for him. Then what are we going to do? I want to be very complacent following this tradition and the other tradition, this, this religion or other religion. Or we need to start constantly struggling 
to find their own identity. And that's what cost a lot. And that's what cost a lot to Israel. Because Israel wanted to be unique, but at the same time they wanted to be accepted by the world. And that is a very tough combination. Because you're going to be liked by someone and hate by the other. <coughs> we ourselves, in this place, in this community, we are taking steps. And sometimes they are not the most popular steps. And sometimes it costs us hard to make the decisions or to look at it that way. I am one of those that I don't like changes. You need to understand me that. I am when I am comfortable, don't, don't move my chair. I sit there and don't move me. And then when you make change in the church, I feel uh, 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 not comfortable. But uh, you know what? I am glad that sometimes they change the chair. Because they force me. They forced me to do something. Don't be too complacent to everything. Question everything. Check everything. It, but everything in the right way. Don't get upset. Search. Look. Because this is the way that God has made us. He wants to have a relationship. When you have a relationship with a person, you don't want a person who all the time to say, yes, yes, yes. You will be bored to death and living. <coughs> you want to have a living relationship. And you know, I believe that we have the right to question God. Boy, what did you say? Oh yeah, because I want to know. And if he answers or he doesn't answer me his business. But I had the right to ask. Yeshua said, you shall ask it, you will give it to you. Knock and will be open to you. You, you don't receive because you don't ask. You know, if, uh, I have a person very close to me, I don't want to mention the name, but I start looking for a job. And what happened? You know, he's still waiting for, for the people to call him. I said to him, move, move. And I said, I know somebody. And that just happened to us that because he was asking and asking and asking, got it. That's it from God. Because God wants for us that we have a relationship with Him. God, blessed be His name, wants us a living relationship. No, God, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know. But uh, it's, I, I need that you tell me something. I want clarity in this area. I want to please show me the way. I, I, I want the peace. That go beyond all understanding. That's what I am looking for. Then God gave us the Torah. And the Torah is a living document. If you call it document. The Torah is a living thing. The Torah moves us. The Torah shapes us. The Torah forms us. Thank you so much for this time. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shabbat shalom.